Haven, an expert, an authority, a connoisseur, a specialist, a professional, a knowledge king, a rock and roll sports talker. Coons Ford of Security Boulevard is proud to present The Sports Maven with Bruce Posner, a no-holds-barred look at the sports world. Now, here's Bruce Posner, The Sports Maven. That later because right now it's a subject that lasts the year long and uh, and that of course is Maryland basketball a lot of things happening on the front bring in my good buddy Wayne Viner Wayne how are you this morning oh doing okay Bruce thanks for having me yeah as always uh, Wayne Kevin Herter declares for the draft now I did some research last night and neither Fernando or Herter or on any of the mock drafts, on any of the uh, supposed, you know, you know, selections or whatever. However, in 2019, Bruno Fernando is chalked up on the mock draft as number two. Uh, this bodes well for Maryland, I think, as far as him coming back. And Herter also is in the is into the first round, so. I think we could kiss Herter senior year away. But uh, what's your take on it? Well, Bruce, first of all, I think we're having uh, board problems again this morning. I only heard half of what you said. Can you hear me okay? I hear you perfect. Is that better? That is better. Okay. Well, I saw one Sports Illustrated poll that had Bruno Fernando Ray as the 23rd best talent in the draft. That is the only place that I've seen him listed that high. I, I think that both Herter and Bruno are going to take a look at what the NBA scouts tell them, but I think this is just a look-see. I don't expect either of them really, for me, to go. Now, there's a lot more chatter that Bruno's going to go, and that Kevin Herter's just going to see what the scouts have to tell him. But as a basketball analyst, and you've seen pretty much every Maryland game for the past 40, 50 years. Thank you, for, would, that. Thank you for that reference to my age. <laughs> uh, well, you just watched a lot of basketball. You're still 25 years old. Okay, that's um, better. What, what would you tell Kevin Herter he has to work on if Bruce Posner was an NBA scout? Well, you know, toward the end of the year, all right. First of all, Herder is very turnover prone. All right. Uh, does he handle the ball well enough for the NBA? I'm not sure that that's the case yet. And toward the toward the end of the year, uh, his shot was leaving him a little bit, and I, I don't think his game was in unison. I think he just has to get, uh, you know, a little bit stronger. And again, he's got to make that shot dead eye if he wants to be taken high. I don't think it's there yet. Streaky, yes. Clutch, definitely yes. But uh, I think it's got to be more consistent, and I think he's got to be better on the on the drives of the hoop where he doesn't turn it over or maybe uh, self-creation of the shot. What's your take? I agree that my primary thing for Herder is if you give him the ball, he has to be able to create his own shot. If you give him the ball when he's open, he's a really good basketball player. But having him handle the ball and create his own shot, that stuff that needs some work. The other thing that needs definite work in watching him fairly closely for the past two years is he has to survive contact. Much like that uh, former NFL rule where you have to survive contact with the ground to make a completion, Kevin Herter has to survive contact in the lane and be able to hold on to the ball and finish the play. So between those two and the turnovers, I'm not so sure they're all on him. He doesn't have the, the greatest offensive juggernaut at Maryland. Maybe if he had some higher IQ offensive help, those turnovers wouldn't be there. But just about him, for him to really be successful, and I think for Maryland to be really successful next year, he has to be more of a focal point of the offense and be able to handle that load with consistency. 
You know, the college basketball season was incredible. And last night I was with a lot of the people from UMBC as uh, UMBC was celebrated at uh, Camden Yards uh, again on another cold night. Uh, And it was fantastic, except one thing. This now defection of players to the NBA uh, almost on a you take a look at Duke. Did they not lose all five players to the, you know, to the NBA and I believe me, I don't feel sorry for them. They got this kid Zion Williamson coming in next year. Have you caught him yet? He's supposed to be the best player in America. He's not the best. He might be. This guy doesn't even belong in college. This is ridiculous. This guy's so good. But uh, and plus, he's got. They got three more. The whole thing is ridiculous. It's it's like a, it's like an internship one year in the in in college, and for those not quite as good, they maybe do two. This one and done rule has to be eliminated, or else they're going to absolutely ruin college basketball. Maryland is Maryland, you know, and I. They don't know which way to turn, and you're not talking about a team that's coming off a tremendous year, and there's so much uncertainty. Yeah, they've got four really good players coming, really good. But what's going to happen if Jalen Smith comes next year? And plays unbelievable, Wayne. That we're going to be sitting there in December, January, and every time he dunks the ball, you're going to elbow me and go, he's going pro. You better enjoy him while you have him. He's out of here. Yeah. And that's no fun. You're it is, right. It is no fun. And, and you know, I've been harping on this for a while. One and done must be gone. If a kid wants to go pro out of high school, he has every right to. And if he comes to college... He should stay at least two years, all right? And I think three years, but we'll give them, you know, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt and say two years, and that's the choice, and that's how it has to come down. And if they and if they made that limit three years, it would make college basketball unbelievable, and also it would help so many kids who flame out when they try and go pro and they're not ready. Or... As the G League now ups its uh, base salary to $35,000, or it makes the G League a legitimate basketball league at the level of AAA basketball, uh, to, as it is in baseball. Well, that the, mean, the league is legit, and it's the same thing for hockey. Those World Junior Hockey Championships, you know when you watch those that you're seeing the next level of stars in the NHL, but they're not in college. So either the you stay in college, or the G League has to become a real possibility because there just aren't enough jobs. This isn't baseball. There aren't 25 kids on a team. Not even hockey where you generally take 25 and not even close to football in the 53-man limit. So you're talking about a pro league that has 12 players per team, and that's one of the difficulties here. Is it is hard to make it in the NBA. There's so few jobs. There's so few minutes. Well, look, so, the, the first round, what do you have, 32 picks or 30 picks? Mm-hmm. That's 30 players in the entire world. That's the world. That's not just the United States. So if you have five or six foreigners in the first round, now you're down to 25 players out of every college player in the country. And the second round is very problematical. You've seen, you know, Jake Lehman has certainly not flourished in the NBA. He's barely playing. Uh, Diamond Stone is is lingering in the G League. Guys like you and me who follow everybody probably don't even know what team he's on. Uh, certainly from Maryland, that is. My point is that uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're gonna take that, if you're gonna take that stance and you don't care about college, you're probably better off going to the G League. All right, you're probably better off going out of high school because look at a guy like Quinn Cook. Took him four years to make it happen, and now he's a pretty integral part of uh, Golden State. This is a guy who played at Duke, played pretty well, wasn't drafted because there's there's just not enough there's not enough spots. You know, thirty spots, thirty in the second round, and the second round, unless you're one or two or three, is a waste. The, the whole system has to be designed, or the end result is they're going to ruin college basketball. And for the NBA to participate in the ruination of college basketball is only a detriment to itself. 
Well, a lot of people say you can go to Europe and play. And while that is true, I just wish there was a secondary league in America that that was a viable alternative. Because I agree that from what I can tell, there are a lot of kids that are just, especially the really good ones that are coming to college as a one-year rental, and they're moving on to the pros. And it doesn't even matter if they play. Kyrie Irving got hurt early in his Duke career. He went pro, went the first round. This kid from Missouri, who was one of the top players, top recruits in the country, was hurt most of the year. I think he might have played a total of 60 minutes of college basketball because he was hurt. He's going pro. He's in the first round. So it doesn't even matter if you play. Yeah, it's a way station. And, and if let's say if, if Herter and uh, Fernando do wind up leaving, it, it, it cripples Maryland. You know, this system is not working. And Turgeon won't know this for another two months. And at this point, what in the world can he do if they leave? Right. It's too late that if somebody is on the borderline of leaving or not and they go, there's no way to backfill that. Yeah, well, so, there is a way to do it, and that's to eliminate the transfer rule of sitting out of here. And that's only going to make things 100 times worse. Well, you brought up that in lacrosse, and we do, while I'm still on the air here, have to go over Maryland's recruits because they have a heck of a recruiting class in lacrosse. But, you know, it doesn't affect well, – well, you know this better than I do. How does it affect college lacrosse and a kid like Logan Wisnowskis of Baltimore area – uh, prospect goes to Syracuse, it doesn't work out for him, he transfers, and he immediately plays for Maryland, and he's had a couple hat tricks. How does that work, but he's, yet it wouldn't work in basketball? He He's had more than a couple hat tricks. So yeah, it, it works fine. Maryland's lost a lot of players, too. I mean, they lost one of the best players in the country, a two-time Tort Award nominee, uh, uh, Canizero, Connor Canizero. And, but but yeah. why is it okay in lacrosse, but you'd say it would ruin college basketball? Because because in college basketball, uh, there's money involved. There's mm-hmm. a lot more emphasis on, you know, in other words, when Tillman lost kind of zero, he said, Bruce uh, Connor's leaving. I said, okay. And he says, we'll be all right. And sure enough, they were in the national championship and happened to lose to the team that Connor went to, Denver. But... Uh, it's not a monetary situation. Uh, in other words, if Maryland plays Hopkins next Saturday, and it's a 10,000 attendance crowd, and that's unbelievable for lacrosse. Well, you're in, in basketball, you're playing you know, 40 games, 30, 20 games at home, and you better be around fifteen to 20,000 a, t- a game or you can't make it. Uh, so I think the money aspect of it would, would open up uh, Pandora's box on immediate transfers. And I'm not saying it's wrong. Because, I mean, whoever thought graduate students would be able to transfer without sitting out a year. It's just that a kid... And also, you've got 12... you got a, 10 kids on the field in lacrosse. In basketball, you got five. And lacrosse, you probably... You was Maryland use about 18, 19 guys a game, maybe even more. And uh, in, in basketball, you use seven. So if a guy's number eight, he's gone if he can move to another school and play. So I think it would ruin basketball. I really do. Let's move right, on. I've got, Let's move I've on. got an Orioles question for you. Shoot. Did you get the hat? What hat? I thought they had a hat that had the Oriole logo on the front and a UMBC retriever on the side, or is that a, just a specialty item? I must have been late. All right. <laughs> I didn't see the hat. All right. All right. Really well, well, how was your time at Atman's last night? Let's go over that. Yeah, Atman's was busy, and uh, the crowd was a little bit better. It's supposed to be, you know, they're playing a day game today. They're expecting 25,000 people. Day game tomorrow, they're expecting 30,000 people. A night game, you know, it was cold again, Wayne. It was cold. You know, it's, it, it's no other way to put it. But I want to talk a little bit more Maryland basketball. I'm going to handle the Orioles in the next segment. Uh, the schedule. I looked at it, home games alone. That means we don't, re, you know, we don't go to these three places: Illinois, Indiana, and Northwestern. I think that's a bit of a break with Illinois and Indiana coming in and not having to uh, go back. And also uh, Northwestern, also because Northwestern will be in its new gym this year. Away games. This this stinks. Michigan State, uh, Rutgers, and Iowa. 
Now, having only an away game at Iowa is not good. Would you agree? Well, Iowa's star, I think, for next year is Luca Garza, who uh, was coached in high school by Lefty's son, That's uh, which is interesting. He chose to go to Iowa. They were pretty bad this year, Bruce. I was not a Big Ten power anymore. As far as that Illinois home game, that Illinois home game is going to be played at Madison Square Garden as part of a day-night doubleheader. I think the day game is basketball. The night game, they're going to have Big Ten hockey at Madison Square oh, that's Garden. That's right there. That's the 11 o'clock in the morning game or something. That's I'd even run. So we lose our home game, correct? Right. We actually have one less home game, but Maryland, as always, uh, says that New York's the second biggest alumni market, and they think that's going to be a great Maryland crowd at Madison Square Garden. It always is. Every time we've gone to New York, Wayne, which is every time they're in New York, uh, it's always a Maryland-dominated crowd. It's a tremendous home game, and it's it's the funny thing about it is that uh, we walk around in New York, and they know who we are from the videos. All right? <laughs> Those videos are fairly popular, Bruce. All right, away, so we go a home away. I don't like having to only play at Michigan State, period. That's our biggest home game. Yeah. And right now, that. that's like losing the new version of the Duke game. That That is your focus game, so it, it stinks when you don't get that one. Well, that's a bit of a stretch, but that would have happened in the ACC, too, because Duke was not the rival. I don't know if they still have that uh, issue, but... Uh, Duke wouldn't have been coming to Maryland every year. Uh, the rest of all the other teams are home and away, which is great. And, uh, wow, I wanted to talk about Damon Evans. We've got a couple minutes left. Watch Press Box tomorrow morning, everybody. That's 10.30 a.m. on Channel 2. I don't know what the cable numbers are. I think it's 5.13 on the Verizon. Or go to PressBoxOnline.com. Had a pretty extensive discussion with Gary Stein and Stan Charles about why myself and you are so much in favor of Damon Evans being named the athletic director. And you want me to sum it up, Wayne, or you want to? Well, uh, you just did it on TV, so let's let's have you do it. And that also will be posted on TerpTalk.com. So as soon as we get that uh, link... From the press box, guys will have it up. Right. Uh, Bruce, you go ahead and take this. Damon Evans uh, took the Georgia program to the top of the scale uh, when he was there from 2004 to 2000. Was it 10, I think, as, uh, as AD? And this guy knows what to do. He is, and furthermore, from what I understand, I heard some more last night, is a lot of the coaches really like Damon Evans. And he's a no-nonsense guy, hardworking. He's there. He's present everywhere, just like uh, Anderson was. He travels. You know, he just doesn't go to Maryland basketball and football. He's everywhere. And, but most important, he knows how to build a program in football. And that's what Maryland needs. So the, here's the guy who's almost had an apprenticeship as the sub athletic director and but he's not the athletic director Wayne and you know that that's a big difference and well that's one of the things when things don't quite go right up Maryland that you go there's nobody really in charge and right now and it's been true since the end of September there's really been nobody officially in charge of the whole thing and and if you do a four month search I mean, there could be damage done in that period that's irreparable. And furthermore, who are you going to bring in? I mean, who? where's the big football guy who's been successful? Who you're going to, It's all about football. We know that. Maryland basketball runs its own cycle. It really does. It needs marketing. It needs promotion. But not like football does. And... Uh, and that's what you need to enhance the program. That's where the money is. And, and Damon Evans has that experience, and I don't know why there's a need for a nationwide search, as always, when you got the guy in the backyard who's ready to do the job. Is that a good way of putting it? I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, you're talking about a guy who played in the SEC. He was an associate athletic director at Missouri, which is big-time SEC football. He was the top guy at Georgia had a couple of personal issues, ends up coming to Maryland as the associate 
AD, very involved with the football program. If you like the direction the football's going in now, and as Bruce has brought up many times, time's a waste in here. Let's get this to work and let's get it to work now. You have an SEC football guy in the house. I don't want to change direction again. I want to see this work out. Yeah, you bring in a new. You bring in a new. First of all, Durkin and him have a great relationship, from what I understand. And you bring in a new guy, and the new guy says, "You know, maybe I want my own coach." And I can't take it anymore. You know what I mean? You, you know, Durkin. You know, everybody's in, is, uh, you know has his back. His recruiting class is great. You're in love with the situation. All right. Everybody I talk to is uh, upbeat. There's a tremendous upgrade from last year. But there's got to be some consistency there. And to break it up again with the new AD, you know, it, I just disagree. But, Wayne, we are way over the budget. So uh, I thank you for checking in. I'll cover the Orioles. I'm going to cover uh, the Ravens football schedule. Lots more when we come back. This is Bruce Posner, along with my often co-host, Wayne Viner, of Segment 1 of Coons Ford Presents a Sports Maven. Back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Thanks, Wayne. All right, back here on Segment 2 of uh, Coons Ford Presents the Sports Maven. When you select a professional, you always look to the backgrounds of the persons involved, particularly involving their experience, competence, and established performance. In Maryland, there's only one number one leader with regard to personal injury claims, and that's the firm of Science at Kirk. They've handled more auto accident cases than any firm in the history of the state of Maryland. Donald and his three sons make a formidable team representing their clients. You can call their hotline 24-7 at 1-800-LAWYERS for assistance. And remember, in the nest, Science at Kirk returns this summer uh, as the football season starts, uh, it'll be a Ravens pregame show. Or we might, I, we've been discussing about moving it to a postgame show. We're not sure yet. But uh, it, in the nest, we'll definitely be back uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, late August to view the Ravens schedule. All right. Football. Baseball, which way am I going to go? Let's talk a little bit of Orioles, and I want to take a close look at the football schedule and the draft. This 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 third baseman, uh, Tim Beckham, good hitter, there's no doubt about it, but I've got to tell you something. How many times in the major leagues do you see pop-ups missed? It, it's a rarity, and pop-ups missed cost. A pop-up missed in the first inning cost – Dylan Bunday, uh, a six-inning shutout or whatever, and it might have let him go seven innings because the the roof kind of caved open. He got out of it, but uh, the game on was Thursday afternoon against Detroit. Beckham did not have a good game, and I'm not picking on him or whatever, but look, Manny's made some plays at short that I, I almost have never seen another shortstop make. When he goes into the hole... When he goes into the hole and makes that long throw to first, he's done it twice now. I've never seen anything like that, that throw that he makes. He's incredible. And yesterday, he might help save the game with a, a brilliant play at shortstop. Brilliant play. So the, the plus of him being at short, look, he's great. No matter, he probably could play second. But he probably could play anywhere. He probably could catch. He's got so much talent. But. The only way I look at it where it could be hurting the team a little bit is the fact that, like, the plays he's made in the hole at short could have been routine plays for him at third. The two plays, I mean, the two positions do overlap. And, you know, Beckham is just not, he's really a second baseman, you know, moved to third. I might criticize him because third's not his natural position, but uh, he's killing us. You can't drop, you can't miss pop ups in the major leagues. And yeah, it was a wind blowing, and yeah, it was another cold night, but it just can't, it can't happen. And there were two of them last night. And I, I just don't know where to go with that. Another thing is the Mets right now are desperate for a catcher. 
unless I missed something that happened last night. They are desperate for a catcher. They lost their first string and second string catcher, and they're you're bad. They're now down to third and fourth, and they're not major league ready. It might it be time that maybe they'd have some interest in Caleb Joseph. And, you know, could we get some, you know, they always seem to be chop filled with prospects or fill another hole because it sh- surely looks like Chance Cisco is going to be our guy. And uh, very impressed with him. Very, very impressed. Uh, but is it time to make that kind of a move? Orioles have to do something. I mean, they're sitting, I know it's still early, but they're sitting at 6 and 14, and that's one eighth of the season's over, and they're 6 and 14. So you analyze it to to get to ninety wins, they'd have to go uh, eighty four and uh, fifty six. So that's not going to happen, or in that ball game, it's just not going to happen. And uh, should a move be made? Yeah, as a season ticket holder, I'm not, you know, anxious to, you know, just plow through this season. You know, when Tillman pitches like today, I mean. I didn't even look at the odds on the game, but you can imagine what they could be. Do the Orioles have any shot to win the game today? You know, and Tillman in his last 20 starts has how many wins? Does anybody know out there? Zero. 20 starts, no wins. Now, that's significant in the fact that his ERA also right now is 12. So it isn't like he's been pitching well and not getting support. Bundy could be 4-0 right now. Bundy's been great. I think his ERA is still in the ones, and it should have been uh, should have been a seven-inning shutout for him last night. But I, I I don't know what to say, but I don't know who can play third. Davis played third a little bit, and Alvarez didn't seem to be too good or what they're going to do or if there's somebody in the minors or whatever, but... Maybe there's a third baseman we could get from the Mets because you can't, you're not going to win games with this guy consistently at third base from what he's shown so far. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he'll become uh, fantastic over the next few weeks. But, uh, and the other thing is, there's not many options. It's not like there's options, and I don't think Manny wants to go back to third. But for the good of the team, I don't think he would say no, but I don't know that to be so. Or maybe. Buck has it analytically that he's producing better at short. It doesn't seem that way to me. It just seems like there's been more chances at third that uh, that that have been botched that Manning never would have botched. Never. Uh, I don't know. It's a dilemma, especially when you have somebody like Manning. And the mere thought that he won't be at short next year and he might be wearing pinstripes is enough to make me ill. Big time. But let's look at the bright side. A great win for the Orioles. A home run by who else? Manny. And a two-run double by Mancini. And before you knew it, the Orioles kind of had it under under control. Darren O'Day came in, pitched great last night, unlike the other night, the other day. But I'm wondering if something's up with Brock. I was a little surprised not to see him in the ninth inning last night. But... You know, let's look on the bright side. A good win. You know, you beat Cleveland. Look, this homestand's got to be it. It's got to turn around. I mean, you've got, and I don't care who they're playing and they're underdog and this kind of stuff. You've got, uh, is it, I think it's 10 straight games at home. It's the longest home streak of the year. You need to go six and four on this homestand to bring the record back into some sensibility. And seven and three would be fantastic. And, uh, can it be done? Of course it can be done. But, you know, you beat Trevor Bauer last night. It's a big win for the O's, and it felt like it. Now, something's got to give with these night games. I don't know if they've got to start these games at 6 o'clock. It's just too cold out there in April. It really is. Now, last night wasn't as bad. But today, they're supposed to play at 4 o'clock, and uh, they're expecting 25,000 people. And tomorrow they're playing at well, their usual 1 o'clock game, and they're uh, expecting, you know, 25, 30,000. It's all about the weather. I mean, I know, you know, that the Nationals have been outdrawing us, which it is what it is. Of course, they're a uh, – the losing hasn't helped. But everything about the stadium is better. There's no reason not to go. And, folks, this is our team. You know, love them or don't love them, but this is our team. And, you know, 
if you love baseball, and there certainly are inexpensive packages to get there now. The fact you can bring your kids, I think, during a week and sit upstairs, and the kids go for free. There's a lot of there's a lot of po- positive stuff going on at the stadium. The upgrade in food, not just at Mint's Deli, but across the whole board. Uh, it's great. It's just a great experience, and uh, it's it. It just. I don't know what the announced crowd was last night, but uh, you know, it looked to me to be about fifteen thousand. Billy's checking it now. What the announced crowd was, but uh, something's got to give, for sure. All right. Uh, real quick, we're going to save the Raven the uh, the Raven schedule to the next segment. Uh, lacrosse today, the big games, of course, is uh, Johns Hopkins at Michigan. If Johns Hopkins would lose that game, Maryland wins tomorrow. Maryland would clinch a share of the Big Ten title regular season, which is always one of the five goals in lacrosse. I think five goals. You would say number one goal is, well, let's put it this way. To make the tournament is always a goal, but we got to go further than that. For Maryland, their main goal is to make the Final Four, to win the um, Big Ten championship tournament, to win the regular season at Big Ten, and not at the bottom of the list, it, as important as anything else, is the need to beat Johns Hopkins as much as they can. Next week is Hopkins week, and we'll certainly talk about that a lot on Wednesday, which will also be our preview of the NFL draft and uh, a look at, close look at where D.J. Moore is going to fall as it gets closer and closer, what the quarterback situation is. It sure looks like Baker Mayfield is sort of locked into the Jets right now. That's what I hear. I mean, the Jets want him desperately, and somehow or another it's going to happen, and where the trades are going to come. A lot to talk about on Wednesday uh, for, for of course, the Maryland. It's Hopkins week, and for our Hopkins listener out there, it's Maryland week. Uh, you know, right now I saw something that sickened me a little bit, and that was the one of the first bracketology predictions has Maryland and Hopkins meeting into the quarterfinals, which makes no sense to me if Hopkins number three or four in the country. A Maryland-Hopkins game should be in the final four if it happens. All right? And the attendance last night was 20,004. All right? All right? I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe I didn't see the upper deck. But it looked to me, I, I did say, it, to me, it was about seventeen grand. So I guess 20000 isn't bad for a team that's 5-14 uh, and 14 on a cold night. Of course, it was a Friday night. Let's see what happens today. Looking forward to it. I know Admin's Delhi was hopping last night. Um, again, we're located right in home plate uh, area. When you walk in, if you come in through the club section, you can walk straight out and get your Admin's before you go upstairs. Or if you come in, it seems like everybody seems to pass it. And it's really, I'll give credit to the stadium. They've done a great job with the food situation. Delaware Valley has really upgraded everything, and uh, they're doing a super job. All right, with that, we will go to break number two. This is Bruce Posner. We're brought to you by Coons Ford of Security in Baltimore, uh, right now, there's so many deals going on, and for all you former Coons Ford customers, you should be getting a letter in the mail or an email telling you about a special additional uh, discount that Coons itself is giving. Nothing to do with the rebates, nothing to do with your traded, nothing to do with 0%. This is above and beyond. You can use a rebate or take the cash. And this is for a previous Coons Ford's customer, and there are thousands of them out there, and many of whom listen to Coons Ford Presents a Sports Maven. So with that, we'll uh, get back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. This is the Sports Maven Show, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, here's the Maven himself, Bruce Posner. All right, back here on segment three of Coons 4 presents the Sports Maven. Once again, I'll remind you, 10.30 tomorrow morning, I will be on Press Box Live. Uh, actually, it's not live because it was taped, but uh, with Stan the Fan and Gary Stein, we had a good time. And uh, Brent Harris was on first talking about uh, the indoor football league, which I haven't been to a game yet, but uh, the brigade, but... I think I'm going to have to get down there because it seems uh, like it's catching on. 
Yes, okay. KD and Sean Livingston tweaked their ankles at the end of another Warriors victory over San Antonio. Warriors are now up 3-0. I would not be surprised, knowing Steve Curry, if he might, now, unless they're fine and everything's cool, but KD left early, it's Kevin Durant, and they get ice, and so did Livingston. I, I would not be shocked if he might take a lark and give those guys a couple more days rest in game four on the road uh, at San Antonio. And, of course, the whole basketball world was stunned with the sudden death of Greg Popovich's wife. Greg Popovich is a uh, just a icon in the sport, especially right now. And, didn't, of course, he didn't coach the other night. And uh, But San Antonio, without Kawhi Leonard, is just no match. And the word is now the Lakers are going to make a hard, hard push for Kawhi Leonard. And... I have to mes- mention that McDonough's Megan Whittle added five uh, goals to her uh, scoring record at Maryland. And when you analyze it, she broke the record of the great Jen Adams, who now is the coach of Loyola. It's hard to even understand what that means. This girl is just, she gets double teamed, she gets face guarded, she gets everything you can to stop her from scoring, and yet... I think she's over 60 goals already as Maryland remains undefeated in the Big Ten, faces a big showdown with Northwestern on Thursday night. And, of course, senior day at College Park on Sunday. I'll be out there for that game, take a day off from the Orioles. And uh, Maryland plays Ohio State. This is a replay of the national championship. Ohio State has not had a good season for whatever reason. I mean, uh I guess the loss of talent, but you know they'll be just foaming at the mouth for this particular game, and they need it for a chance to make the playoffs. So every every Big Ten game has been a struggle. Uh, the Michigan score was deceiving that Maryland won thirteen to five because it was, I think six to five, you know, at the end of the third quarter or near the end of the third quarter. So every Big Ten game has been tough. Hopkins is on the road to uh, Michigan today, and. Uh, Conry's looking for his first win, but Hopkins is poised to uh, enter the week next week with a shot to defeat their nemesis, the Terps, and get a share of the uh, Big Ten Championship, should, should it go that way. All right, the Ravens schedule came out. Now, here's the biggest impact on the Ravens schedule. Everybody sit there and think. I saw it this morning on the news. Billy's nodding his head. The biggest impact on the NFL schedule this year, believe it or not, was Ed Sheeran. It's almost unbelievable that 10 games had to be filtered through because Ed Sheeran is playing, is on tour in 10 of the cities on game days. And Ed Sheeran, of course, if you don't know, is just a... Just, he's look, he's good. I don't know how he can sell at 80,000 seat stadiums. But you know what? He does it in an hour. It's incredible how big this guy is. And Beyonce affected two games, and Taylor Swift affected three games, which it's 15 games the NFL schedule were affected by concerts. And that kind of says it all. But uh, I, I heard that this morning, and I was like just befuddled. The Ravens' schedule is not one of these attractive big game schedules, although there, I think I read there's seven playoff teams in there, which is pretty big. But uh, they open against Buffalo at home on September the 9th, which I love to open at home. I really do. I think it's a big edge. And, and this year they open at home, and if I'm not mistaken, they close at home. Sure right. do, against the Browns. Right, against the Browns. Uh, from there, you know they'll be one and one because they go to Cincinnati, and for whatever reason, their play at Cincinnati is just atrocious. Doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. Unless out. everybody's sitting their starters, right? <laughs> well, and especially, but if they don't have a revenge, that's a night game. Naturally, we get two night games on the schedule on the road, and I'm happy about that because I hate night games. You know, you're always dealing with weather. They start at 8.30. They're over 11, you know, 11.30, quarter, 12. And, you know, almost every night they, it gets cold. Then I, I like the day games, 1 o'clock in the heat. That's good enough for me. But uh, 
They play Pittsburgh at Pittsburgh at night a game. I don't know how many years in a row this has happened, but it's almost unbelievable that that is an extremely difficult situation for the Ravens. So you look at their schedule, Buffalo, Cincinnati, Denver, and Pittsburgh. Uh, that's a gauntlet to open the season. It really is. Then they go to Cleveland and at Tennessee. And then they when do they run the home game streak? Here it is, week nine. They play the Saints at 4.05. That's the only odd time they have uh, in week seven. But weeks eight, nine, and 11, home again at the Panthers, at Pittsburgh, and then they come home versus Pittsburgh at home, rather. So you have Pittsburgh, a bye, Cincinnati, and the Raiders at home three weeks in a row, November 4th, 18th, and 25th. Sorry about that. There's a bye on the 11th. And they also have an interesting game. They go to play the L.A. Chargers on week 16 in Los Angeles. And they'll get to play before a raucous crowd of probably 22,000. If they're lucky. Right. <laughs> so uh, uh, that should be – I like the schedule. I really do. But it isn't it, – the marquee games, it's like – I know you hate to play New England, but it's like playing New England in school. It's like who you want to play. You want to get a shot at them, and you want to get a shot at the Eagles, and, you know, it's not there this year. Uh, that being said, I, it is funny to me that first time I ever saw it, single-game tickets went on sale immediately. That hasn't happened ever with the Ravens since they've been. It's always you wait, you give the season ticket holders a shot to buy extra seats, and then you open it up to the uh, to the public, for, and there are seats available. But this was, you want to buy them, I'm telling you what, get them now. Because there's probably some strong seats available, and, you know, you don't have to pay the scalp. You can pick the games. and Obviously, the New Orleans game is going to be a big one. The Pittsburgh game is always a huge one. And Denver as well. Uh, and Cincinnati, looking at the schedule. You got Tampa, uh, Tampa Bay at home. I'm not so sure about that. Uh, the Browns or the Browns. But you've got some good home games that you can get some decent seats for the low dollar of face value. But uh, it's hard to think about buying football tickets right now. But, you know, it's funny. The Ravens were so bad, we were looking for, forward to the Orioles. The Orioles are so bad, we're looking forward to the Ravens. It's like a never-ending streak. But today, today is uh, my producer, uh, substitute producer, big game for the Caps. Caps are at 2-2. Two -two. They lost the first two at home, won the next two. Uh, right now, I'll go on the limb. Six games for the Caps are going to win this thing. I think they're better than this uh, Columbus Blue Jacket team. And I want to play Pittsburgh. All right? And I, you know, the Caps shouldn't even look ahead to the second period. Because, you know, this is a team that lost two games at home in overtime, both of which they had two goal leads. Multiple. All right? <laughs> Multiple times. All right? Two goal leads, a playoff game, lose them both at home. And if I remember correctly... Was it the first game or second game when they must have five man up advantages down the wire and couldn't score? It was, uh, I think it was the first game. They it was were, almost unbelievable that they could they not had a score. Five minute major or something like that. Right. Well, they got two goals on that. They took advantage of that. But uh, they have to win. They cannot keep losing. But what the heck? They're the Capitals. And as far as the Wizards go, uh, it's funny, I came home last night. And I what did I do? I turned on the uh, Cavalier game. I forgot the Wizards were even playing. The Wizards had an easy win over Toronto. Why? Because Bradley Beal was scoring. Bradley Beal dis disappeared in the second game. He was There was not a Bradley Beal sighting. He had nine points. Uh, and then last night, I understand his family was there, and that spurs him on. Send the family to all the games. What's the big deal? You're paying these guys a million dollars. You know, million dollars to uh, play, and uh, as we run out of time here, uh, big news: LeBron lost, the Cavaliers lost. This is not on LeBron. This is one man cannot beat five. The Cavaliers just don't have it. Uh, to me, they might get through this series, but they might not get through this series. Who's your pick out of the East? Out of the East, that's a hell of a question right now, but. Uh, Wow. It's a disaster. Right it now, is isn't a disaster. It? It's a disaster. You know what? I'd have to really think about it. But can I still say Cleveland, which is almost ridiculous? <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know. 
you know, maybe Philadelphia. I think I, that's right I now where my to, eggs are. Gumbles to my head, I pick Philadelphia. We're out of time. Thanks a lot, Billy. We'll be back uh, on Wednesday for Hopkins Week. And, of course, we'll preview the NFL draft. This is Bruce Posner. You've been listening to Coons Ford Presents the Sports Maven.